Leadership support for the Vegas PBS production of Makers, Women in Nevada History is made possible by the Eleanor Kagi Foundation, a Lynn M. Bennett legacy, supporting animal welfare and education-focused organizations in Southern Nevada. The Eleanor Kagi Foundation. Major sponsorships are provided by Cashman Equipment, a family-owned and operated company that is proud to be a part of Nevada's past, present, and future. Cashman Equipment, since 1931. Frank and Victoria Fertitta Foundation Limited, supporting a diversity of causes and organizations that strengthen our community, securing the future of Southern Nevada through philanthropy. MGM Resorts International, which is proud to sponsor Vegas PBS and this broadcast as a celebration of the role women have long played in shaping Nevada. Additional support comes from Bank of America, Comprehensive Cancer Centers of Nevada, Nevada Humanities, Vegas PBS Women's Engagement Council, Most history is written about men, and uh, I think we're missing a lot. Women have had a role forever. I mean, they've, from the beginnings of our state's history. Accomplishment is worth recognition. I don't care when, I don't care where or who, any accomplishment. Coming up in this episode of Makers, Women in Nevada History. The 1950s, 60s, and 70s were tumultuous times in our state and across the country. People were demanding change, change to policies, to opportunities, and to attitudes. Tonight we'll discover how Nevada's makers successfully navigate the seas of change and ride the wave of expanding opportunities. Their significant efforts serve to benefit their families, their communities, and the state as a whole. We start our story in 1950. World War II was over and the U.S. economy was strong. This robust economy puts disposable income into the pockets of many Americans, and Nevada's tourism industry benefited. In Las Vegas, in the 50s, an evolution was underway. Las Vegas really develops as a city after 1950 with the expansion of our strip casinos and hotels. Lots of entertainment and dancing going in very strong in Las Vegas in the 50s, 60s, 70s. Clark County's population was just over 48,000 in 1950. Within the next 20 years, it would quadruple. Vegas' hotel casinos offered jobs that attracted many people, and the casino showrooms competed for the best entertainment. Las Vegas was on its way to becoming the entertainment capital of the world. Women worked in a variety of women's jobs, in gaming and hospitality, but those jobs were limited by both gender and race. Despite the limitations, some women moved into positions of power in the 50s and 60s. One of those women is the first maker we'll meet. Claudine Williams came from somewhat humble beginnings and ended up becoming an owner-operator of a major casino on the Las Vegas Strip. Williams and her sister were raised by their mother in rural Louisiana. They were my grandmother's only two children and my grandmother was a widow early on, so it was really just the three of them for uh, most of their life. Williams left school at an early age and began working in private clubs. They were small. They were in districts where um, it was semi-legal. She learned every game herself. In 1965, Claudine and her husband Shelby came to Las Vegas and purchased the Silver Slipper Casino. 
In 69, they sold the silver slipper and used the profits from that sale to build the Holiday Casino. When my uncle sold the slipper um, and then he decided to go into the Holiday Casino, he was pretty ill. In 1977, Shelby Williams died and Claudine stepped up as president and general manager of the Holiday Casino. People underestimated her at the beginning. People thought when, she, when Shelby died that she would sell the casino and walk away. And that was the last thing on her mind. So she, that was the big deal for her to take over as the only woman have a place on the strip like that. She persevered and she worked really hard. She was always on the job. And, um, you know, I think that kind of helped her gain respect from some of the men in the industry. Williams' work ethic and management style helped her gain the respect and admiration of many people in the Las Vegas community. She was extremely charming. Claudine was a flirt, so she disarmed people. She, she really was, and women loved her and wanted to be her, and men wanted to be with her. I think she was definitely a champion of women, and I think she was really inspirational. Claudine Williams also became a powerful community leader, serving on 28 boards and commissions. She's also been a very generous philanthropist. She made money in this community, and she gave that back to this community. Claudine Williams, community benefactor and gaming industry legend, truly personified a maker. The gaming and entertainment industry drove much of Las Vegas' economic expansion in the post-war decades. But there were many women building impressive careers in other areas too, including our next few makers. The first is Clarine Kitty Rodman. Rodman moved from a traditional office job to become an executive in construction. She spent her career shaping the Las Vegas skyline, literally. Kitty was born in Virginia. Well, her father passed away when she was about six years old, she had told me, and her mother passed away when she was 13. She had to work. I think it was during the Depression, and there wasn't a whole lot of money, but she worked while she went to school, and she got good grades. Kitty's husband, Dick Rodman, was stationed at Nellis Air Force Base after returning from service in Korea. She moved here around 1952 to be with him, and quickly got a job at Sierra Construction Corporation. Kitty Rodman uh, began as a secretary. She worked from that position up to become a major partner in a construction firm that built many of the properties on the Strip, buildings at UNLV, buildings downtown. It was very obvious that she was an equal partner in every way and that the other partners were quite dependent on her financial abilities. At Sierra Construction, Rodman helped sculpt the Las Vegas Strip, the high-rise buildings of the Tropicana, Hacienda, the Dunes, and Treasure Island were just a few of their many area projects. Kitty Rodman was a trailblazing businesswoman who believed in giving back to her community. Her concerns about education, about the youth of our community was very present all the time. Rodman also made significant contributions to UNLV and its students. That's how she helped people through the university, through Opportunity Village. She helped people that were looking for jobs that could never find a job and she would hire them just because they were young, unexperienced, and she could give them that experience. If Kitty Rodman worked to build the area skyline, our next maker, Selma Bartlett, helped to finance its business development. During a time when women bankers were extremely rare, she became one of the first female bank officers in the state. Selma Bartlett and her husband, Troy, moved to this area when Troy was out at the Nellis Air Force Base. The couple came to Southern Nevada in 1954. That same year, Selma, a college graduate, began working at the newly established Bank of Nevada in Henderson. In 1962, she was promoted to the position of bank manager at Bank of Nevada's Henderson branch. Selma became very dedicated to building the communities of Henderson and Green Valley. She did that as a banker. 
And she will be the first to tell you she did not do it alone. She did it with a group. Bartlett has dedicated herself to personally and financially supporting her community and in 2013 was inducted into the Nevada Business Hall of Fame. The women we've met so far have been determined, smart, strategic, and hardworking. Let's take a moment now to hear from three modern makers on what traits they think help to make women of both the past and the present such effective leaders. I think um, problem solving skills, uh, we got the, the big reward on that. I think women who use their power well, use their power to lift others up without diminishing their own value. Women, I think, tend to be much more inclusive. Uh, they are much more open to compromise. They want to have a variety of people involved in the process and the decision making. While our last two makers established successful careers by building up Southern Nevada's communities, our next made hers by informing the people within those communities. Las Vegas native Myron Borders made her mark in the field of journalism. Borders documented the news and dispensed it to the world. I in effect grew up with Las Vegas. My parents moved here when I was, I don't even think I was in kindergarten yet. There was 8,000 people in Las Vegas when they came here. Borders studied journalism at the University of Nevada, Reno, and went on to work for United Press International, a wire service providing news to thousands of newspapers, television, and radio stations. Journalism was still a very much male-dominated field in the early 60s. Being a female reporter had its advantages and disadvantages. They aren't concerned at all about the competition because a woman couldn't possibly beat them. And so, in a sense, that's a great advantage. As far as actually covering news, there is what I called a uniform syndrome. It related to sports, military, and law enforcement. Every time you ran into any of those three levels covering stories, a woman had, had trouble. In 1965, Myron Borders was promoted to the Las Vegas Bureau Chief for UPI. For years, Borders' UPI byline appeared worldwide and covered many of the nation's most captivating news stories. I was involved in the Manson trial, the Charlie Manson trial with the Sharon Tate murder. I covered a portion of that. I covered a portion of the Bobby Kennedy assassination. In Nevada, Borders covered nuclear tests at the Nevada test site and organized crime. Myron Borders, who served as an inspiration to countless up-and-coming female journalists, had some mentors of her own. I think my mentors were probably other women that were in the fight with me. I would say Myron was uh, the greatest mentor I've ever had. She showed me by doing how to be tough but fair. While Borders was establishing herself as an icon in the field of journalism, our next maker was becoming a community leader. Lily Hing Fong and her husband Wing came to Las Vegas in 1950. They opened the popular Fong's Restaurant and eventually moved into real estate development. Lily Fong, a college graduate, became an educator and education advocate. She was hired as the first Asian American to teach in the Clark County public school system. Just two years later, Clark County recognized her as an outstanding teacher. Her belief in the power of education eventually led her to join and then become state president of the American Association of University Women. She eventually ran for uh, university regent in 1974 and served until 1984. Lily and Wing Fong shared their gains in business as benefactors and volunteers within their community. The makers we've met thus far have spent their careers helping to build, to inform, and to benefit Southern Nevada's communities. Coming up next, we'll meet some amazing women who achieved great things at a time when our state and our nation were undergoing a great social, political, and cultural metamorphosis. In the 1960s, the brewing frustrations of many Americans began boiling over. U.S. involvement in the Vietnam War sparked anti-war protests. The women's movement built in intensity, and the African-American civil rights movement exploded. 
The African American Civil Rights Movement sought to end discrimination. It called for equal access to public facilities, employment, education, and housing, as well as the right to vote. While the Civil Rights Act of 1964 prohibited race and sex discrimination in employment, it took a long time for the practice to become a reality. Some of the barriers faced by black women here in Las Vegas had to do with um, just the regular practices in place because of racial discrimination. Schools were segregated, among other things. Communities were segregated. We had the famous West Side community that hardly had any of the amenities that you would find in any other uh, community in Las Vegas. We see photographs sometimes of that West Side community, and we see those photographs of tents and shacks. Well, that's the way blacks lived. Area jobs were limited by both race and sex. My mother was a educated person. She came here from uh, Mississippi uh, at, with a degree in education from um, Alabama State at Montgomery. However, when she arrived here, the positions that she could get was daycare, maid work, washing and ironing. But there were some women who managed to create their own businesses. One of these women, Sarah Ann Knight Preddy, is our next maker. During her career, Knight Preddy distinguished herself as a civil rights activist and entrepreneur. She was the first black woman to have a gaming license in the state of Nevada. Born and raised in Oklahoma, Sarah Ann Knight Preddy followed her family to Las Vegas in the early 1940s. In need of a job, Knight Preddy found herself working in West Side clubs. Sarah Ann learned to deal in some of those small nightclubs, casinos over on the west side. Preddy and her husband eventually moved to Hawthorne, Nevada, where she owned and operated a club. A few years later, she returned to Las Vegas' west side and ran clubs there. Preddy's family also invested in reopening and preserving Las Vegas' first interracial casino, the Moulin Rouge Hotel Casino. In 1971, she worked with the NAACP to establish the Consent Decree. While the consent decree was a huge step forward, it certainly wasn't a cure-all. NAACP really pulled it off, but they didn't follow through like they should have. They followed through a lot, but not with the poor women. We took it and pushed it through with the poor working welfare mother and the poor working families. Ruby Duncan has dedicated her life to helping those in need. Duncan came to Las Vegas in 1952. She found work first as a maid and then as a cook. But after an accident, she lost her job and needed welfare assistance. And welfare rights was always talking about uh, full-time jobs, full-time work. If you make it possible that the country becomes employable full-time, then you, there's no need for welfare. In 1972, when the state of Nevada cut 75% of welfare aid to mothers, Duncan was moved to act. She began organizing demonstrations and marches. That same year, Ruby Duncan, with the support of community leaders, founded a community-run anti-poverty organization called Operation Life. Operation Life sought to provide full services to the impoverished of West Las Vegas. Despite all of the barriers related to racism, segregation, and inequality, women like Ruby Duncan and Sarah Ann Knight Preddy sought to bring positive social change into Nevada's communities. Our next maker did the same through her work in education, community service, and leadership. Delia Dondero is a great example of a woman who was simply volunteering her time for her children, her family. She got her start working in the PTA. She loves to say that Maud Frazier encouraged her to move up in that organization and become a, a chair. Dondero's desire to serve her community continued to grow. In addition to her involvement with various organizations, she eventually made a run for public office. In 1974, she was elected Clark County's first female commissioner, and the male commissioners suddenly had to adjust to working with a woman as their equal. One of her first days on the job, 
there was some confusion regarding her role at a commission meeting. I was knocking on doors and finally Tom Wiesner opened the door to one of the doors and he says, oh, come on in. He s I had my little pencil and pad and he says, uh, you know, we'd like a cup of coffee and you can take some notes. And I looked at him and I said, you know what, I've got the same vote you have. You may need it someday. Take your own notes. Get your own coffee. So that was our beginning. Dondero worked on flood control projects, improving the county hospital, and expansion of the McCarran Airport. Next up, it's the 1970s, and America is focused on the women's movement. The 70s. We're in the midst of the Vietnam War. We are a war-weary nation. Growing unhappiness with the federal government. We had the civil rights movement still enacting a lot of change across communities nationwide. Uh, we have the beginnings of the gay rights movement. It was a time when we were talking about ERA. It was a time when we were talking about all sorts of equity for women. We were talking about equal pay, which had not even been brought up prior to that time. And the Equal Rights Amendment was a prominent piece of legislation during the movement. The Equal Rights Amendment just simply states that the rights of citizens under the law shall not be denied uh, or abridged by the United States or any state based on sex. Today, it's difficult to comprehend the level of inequality and limited rights women had up through the 1970s. Women couldn't get credit in their own name or open up a business without the cooperation of their husband or father. And perhaps most shockingly, women had little control over their reproductive choices. In Nevada, the battle for rights and equality united and mobilized people from across the state. One of them was Jean Ford. Jean Ford is a great example of a middle-class mother who becomes involved in politics uh, and then becomes very involved in advancing women's rights. In 1972, Ford won her campaign for the state legislature and became an advocate for women, children, and the environment. Despite all of the positive principles associated with the Equal Rights Amendment, it did not have unanimous support. What's wrong with asking that everybody be treated equally under the law. But, oh my goodness, the resistance was just incredible. There was resistance from some religious groups. There was resistance from some men. There was resistance from some women who said, I don't want to be equal. I want to be special. Many of the anti-ERA activists saw this as an absolute unmooring of society as we know it. They would give arguments that, well, what if there, what if a woman was a firefighter? Of course, we now have firefighters. What if they went to war? They would be maybe in a foxhole with men. Then, they, of course, the whole argument on the fact that it was going to create this huge bureaucracy. In the end, Nevada did not pass the ERA. But this certainly didn't stop people from fighting for issues related to gender equity, such as violence against women. In the 1970s, few resources existed to help victims of rape. In Las Vegas, a small group of community members created the Rape Crisis Center. Florence McClure directed it. The first problem the Rape Crisis Center was trying to solve was helping the victim survive the event. If it's not safe for her to go home, then there's a place for her to go. But providing rape victims a safe place to stay was only the tip of the iceberg when it came to Florence McClure's efforts. She persisted until action was taken to help raise awareness and to increase funding. Florence McClure is one of the makers because she, with her co-workers, changed the entire view of the state of Nevada legally towards women who had been sexually assaulted. 
Throughout this episode, we've discovered how the efforts of individual women and groups of women greatly affected the course of Nevada's history. Next up, we hear why some modern makers think it's important to recognize the issues, barriers, and accomplishments of women in the past. These were tough women who were willing to take on controversial issues and to put themselves out there for both better and worse. They had the capabilities, they had the knowledge, they had the education in their area. And they had the spine to move forward. To hear other people overcome anything gives us the ability to know that we can overcome anything. In the last half hour, we've met some amazing women who faced significant challenges, who stood up for their rights, and who never stopped embracing and making opportunities for themselves and others. Their determination and bravery helped to build up their Nevada communities and lay the groundwork for its future. Coming up on the next episode of Makers, Women in Nevada History. From the 1980s on, the world started evolving at an astounding rate. The opportunities for American women were practically limitless. In Makers, Into the Future, we're introduced to some of the groundbreaking women who were the first to hold statewide offices. We meet others who ran major businesses and those whose passion bettered their communities. The next Makers will show us where Nevada's women stand today and where they're headed in the future. Leadership support for the Vegas PBS production of Makers, Women in Nevada History is made possible by the Eleanor Kagi Foundation, a Lynn M. Bennett legacy, supporting animal welfare and education-focused organizations in Southern Nevada. The Eleanor Kagi Foundation. Major sponsorships are provided by Cashman Equipment, a family-owned and operated company that is proud to be a part of Nevada's past, present, and future. Cashman Equipment, since 1931. Frank and Victoria Fertitta Foundation Limited, supporting a diversity of causes and organizations that strengthen our community, securing the future of Southern Nevada through philanthropy. MGM Resorts International, which is proud to sponsor Vegas PBS and this broadcast as a celebration of the role women have long played in shaping Nevada. Additional support comes from Bank of America, Comprehensive Cancer Centers of Nevada, Nevada Humanities, Vegas PBS Women's Engagement Council, 